vaccinations yesterday, bringing the state's total to uh, more than 486, and uh, there were seven additional deaths. So Governor Asa Hutchinson is standing by. He is walking up to the podium. Let's go to Governor Asa Hutchinson live. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining for today's uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, update. And I'm pleased to be joined, of course, by uh, Secretary uh, Jose Romero of the Department of Health, uh, but also uh, very pleased to have uh, Dr. Cam Patterson, uh, Chancellor at UAMS, uh, joining us today. And we have uh, Dr. Ivy Pfeffer, who is the Deputy Secretary of Education. Uh, Secretary Key is at the State Board uh, meeting, and but glad to have uh, Dr. Pfeffer here today. And then also a special guest uh, over there is uh, Sarah Turner, who is the uh, a teacher at the Hot Springs School District that will have some comments a little bit later today. Uh, with that, uh, let me go to the cases uh, for the uh, last 24 hours. And in the last 24 hours, we've had an additional 652 new cases uh, in the state. And uh, that brings us to 51,766. Uh, this is down, of course, from uh, the previous day in terms of new cases. Hospitalization continues a good trend. Uh, we're down 13 in hospitalizations to 473. I remember when we were up at 515, I believe it is. So it's nice to have a couple consistent days of decline. Uh, the deaths, uh, regrettably, are uh, nine additional deaths brings us to 582, and uh, Dr. Romero will have additional comments on where those come from. Uh, we have today another decline in active cases where we're down to 6,582 in active cases uh, here in the state. Uh, we have tested 5,192 over the last uh, 24 hours, so uh, a pretty good day in testing uh, up from the uh, previous day for sure. And then with that, uh, let me go to uh, some of the uh, graphs that I think are helpful to see it as well. And uh, you can see uh, where we are today, a little bit over 600 uh, versus some of the other very high days that we've had, but also in comparison to where we need to go uh, to continue down the rolling average. Uh, looks uh, down again, which is where it should go whenever you're having a declining number of cases. Uh, we hope that that trend can continue, but we know that there is nothing guaranteed. Just because you start a trend does not mean that trend is going to continue, uh, but it is a good place to start, and it all depends upon individual actions of people in Arkansas. That's really what it depends upon in addition to the contact tracing and the results of the work of the Department of Health. And then uh, if you go to the active cases, again, as I said, that was uh, down. Uh, you can look to where it was at the height, uh, well over close to 7,500, 7,300 cases. And then if you go to the next one, you'll see the current hospitalization. As I indicated, our hospitalizations are down, uh, which relieves pressure on our hospitals. It allows them uh, to concentrate on other uh, surgeries and needs that the citizens of Arkansas have. And then uh, the seven-day rolling average of positivity cases, here again is uh, the work that we need to do is to continue to get that positivity rate down. And of course, we're down from where it was at the high points, but uh, we want to keep moving that down uh, because that really is the indicator of what's happening in our communities and how we're testing and the results of that. Uh, and then uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, this shows a better day in our commercial labs. Uh, it's back up. It's not where it has been totally, but it is back up certainly from the last two previous days, which is uh, a good sign. And of course, UAMS and the Department of Health continue to contribute significantly uh, to our testing results. Now, let's uh, stop here just for a second. These are two new charts here, and I want Dr. Romero to uh, talk about uh, one of them, but uh, this is the seven-day moving average of new cases uh, among children. 
and that's why I wanted to bring it up. And so if you have, if you look at it July 6th, uh, the top line are the age category of 10 through 18, age 10 through 18, and I think the first point is that as you move into August, you've seen a decline in the new cases among that age group as well as in the lower age group, not a significant decline, but some decline as well. But the other point is, other than the good news that we're making some progress there, is that uh, here in July 6th, for example, we had right at 60 new cases among the age group of 10 through 18. So 60 cases in July 6th. Now what was happening among the 10 to 18 year olds in July 6th. Uh, they weren't going to school. They were simply engaged in community activities, uh, whatever they do in life, whether it's uh, socializing with friends, going to the pool, and as a result of that activity, or it might be that uh, their family member comes home from work and they contract it in that fashion. Uh, but we had 60 some cases. And so uh, the point being that as we move into school, to have an expectation that those 10 to 18 year olds are not going to have other activities, that they're not going to be cases in that age group, really would ignore what we've seen before in the previous months before school started. And so I think that is a reasonable approach as we look at school, understanding that in these categories uh, that will continue to decline if we wear our mask, we socially distance, uh, but at the same time, we are going to have some cases, just as we have cases if we don't have school. Uh, so what we, what we hope, though, is that because of behavior, it certainly doesn't go up. Uh, there's one more slide there that I want Dr. Romero to come and make his uh, comment on uh, and his other comments, and I'm going to come back, and then I want to introduce the announcement that we're going to make today and ask uh, our uh, colleagues to make comments. Dr. Romero. Thank you, Governor. So let me uh, start in reverse, reverse order today and talk about this uh, seven-day average of percent positivity. So um, what we're seeing here is none, that the number of tests for children that are positive is going down with the understanding that the further to your right that you go, that data is less solid because we're be, we will be getting positive tests in. But overall, you can see that, that there's a downward trend in all age groups. That is, that uh, 10 to 18 year old age group, that six to nine year old age group. And those are the, the little ones that'll be going to school. So the trend is downward. The trend towards positivity is downward, not just the absolute numbers. So I think what this is gonna tell us is that Yes, we're going to see cases. It looks like we're having an influence on these curves of positivity in part from this mask mandate, um, and we hope to see this continue downward. It will probably not com completely disappear. Um, as the governor has said, there are cases now in the community, there will be cases in the community, there will be cases in school in the coming months, weeks, but we are prepared for that. We have a plan to investigate those <clears throat> those uh, patients that could have symptoms and to do contact tracing. So uh, with that, let me say that uh, I'll go on with the cases and repeat uh, some of the data and add uh, uh, some uh, newer facts to that. So uh, as uh, stated by the governor, 652 new cases. This was comprised of 639 community cases. Correctional cases were 13. Total cases in the state of Arkansas are 5,000, uh, sorry, 51,766. Uh, we've had a decrease of 13 individuals hospitalized to 473. One decrease in ventilators uh, being used to 112. Um, for the deaths, as mentioned, we had nine additional deaths uh, yesterday. Two of those deaths were late reports from uh, last month. One of those deaths came from a nursing home and one from, correction, from a correctional facility. Um, we've added uh, to the role of, uh, of recovered individuals 786 uh, persons, bringing us now to 44,602 cases. Our active cases, 
for a total of 6,582. The breakdown of that is 71 cases in nursing homes, correctional facilities, 735, and community cases, 5,776. Um, the testing has already been uh, explained by the governor and we have a total testing this month of 67,416 to date. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Romero. And I'm very pleased to uh, recognize a partnership that's been created between the Arkansas Children's Hospital, uh, U University of Arkansas Medical Sciences, the Department of Education, and the Department of Health. This partnership uh, was designed to look at how we can better prepare and communicate uh, with our parents and our school families and our educators about how, from a scientific, scientific medical standpoint, they can be better, best prepared for school. And so we have our Arkansas Ready to Learn Healthy School Guide that uh, is being released today uh, that has been prepared as the latest scientific advice and best practices to help school officials, educators, and families plan for in-person learning. And so I'm very pleased with this partnership. This gives you a sample of it. Uh, and I'll ask uh, Dr. Patterson, if you could, to come comment on this, followed by uh, Dr. Pfeffer. Thank you very much, uh, Governor Hutchinson. Uh, as the Centers for Disease Control and the Arkansas Department of Health have established uh, guidelines for uh, when and how schools should reopen, we have all received questions from uh, school uh, supervisors, from parents, from teachers, uh, and from the general public about what can be done if schools reopen to ensure that that reopening is done in the safest possible way. And what is the science that can be applied to uh, address these issues in ways that lay people in the state of, of Arkansas can understand? Uh, and so with Governor Hutchinson's support, two groups were convened. One was a, a governing group, uh, and that included uh, Secretary Key from the Department of Education, uh, Dr. Romero from the Department of Health, uh, Marcy Doder from Arkansas Children's Hospital, and myself. Um, and then an operating group uh, which reported to the governing group and that operating group was led by Stephanie Gardner, Dr. Stephanie Gardner who is the provost at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences uh, and Dr. Rick Barr who is the chair of, uh, a med uh, chair of pediatrics at UAMS and at Arkansas Children's Hospital. Um, the operating group uh, was broadly representative. Uh, it included parents, it included teachers, uh, it included representatives from um, uh, 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 populations that are, um, uh, have less access to health care, including uh, African Americans, Latinos, and uh, the Marshallese, uh, and included uh, experts in a variety of, of disciplines, as well as representatives from the Departments of Education and the Departments of Health. Uh, we tasked that group uh, to uh, answer three questions. One is, if schools are reopening, how can those schools reopen in a safe fashion? What advice, resources, and protocols can school superintendents, teachers, and parents utilize to ensure that schools reopen in a safe way if they are reopened? Uh, number two is what behavioral resources are available for children under these circumstances, circumstances in which children may be uh, educated in uh, unusual or atypical fashion, uh, in hybrid fashion, or, or even being educated from long distance, uh, creating stress to kids, and how can we manage to cope with that? And then third, um, are there resources that can be made available in real time to address questions that come up, uh, both for uh, uh, school administrators, for, from teachers, or from uh, concerned families about addressing specific issues that, that occur. Um, this group, uh, these two groups were convened about two weeks ago. Uh, and so the fruit of this work that uh, is now available is work that has been assembled over the past two weeks uh, to address these three specific questions. Um, the, the document that you see here is the Arkansas Ready to Learn Healthy School Guide. 
Uh, this is written in, in lay terms and provides uh, a variety of best practices that have been established in a data-driven fashion uh, for uh, creating a healthy K through 12 environment for uh, our students and our teachers as uh, schools are um, coming back online. Uh, there's a sec second document that specifically uh, addresses behavioral health needs for children under the, uh, the current circumstances. Uh, and then Dr. Pfeffer can tell you about the resources that are available in real time. Uh, this is clearly an evolving situation and we consider these documents to be living documents. They will be revised as additional information and science is made available. Um, these documents are not meant to guide whether or not schools open uh, or reopen or, or not. Those are decisions that Governor Hutchinson, Secretary Key, and Secretary Romero will make. Uh, but this is guidance for people in our communities who are looking for guidance to be sure that as we bring our kids back to school, we do that in the healthiest way possible. Uh, we appreciate the support of Governor Hutchinson, uh, Secretary Key, Secretary Romero, uh, Marcy Doder. We appreciate uh, Arkansas Children's Hospital for their contribution. Uh, and we look forward to working with everyone to make sure that just as we have uh, reopened our hospitals to elective procedures in a safe way, that we reopen our schools in, a, in exactly the same safe way. And I can introduce uh, Dr. Pfeffer, who's here from the Department of Education, uh, who's been a key member of, of our team, and she can provide additional information about these documents. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. I've always loved to start a school. Um, as an educator for 25 years, I've had the opportunity to get to be part of many uh, first days of school openings. And um, whether that was in my home district of Pocahontas, and later as I came to the Department of Education, I've had the opportunity to attend first days of school in other districts. It is um, truly a, a neat experience. And, and I know all of us can think about the beginning of school and um, recall the excitement and the memories that you have from that. Um, I think my staff used to always tease me that they, th they thought I liked the beginning of school because I loved the smell of the floor wax and the new dry erase markers. And um, I see some of you out there smiling because you know what I mean. And we have a lot of teachers that have started returning to school this week and they too are excited about a new beginning. However, we know that this uh, start of this school year is going to be a little more difficult. And we know that returning to school this year is going to be very different than it has in the past. And we know that um, in some cases, fear and anxiety are overshadowing the thoughts of the new beginnings and the new goals and the new experiences that have always been part of our um, start going back to school in the past. Therefore, it's really important that we're able to provide consistent and comprehensive supports to teachers and parents as they're making decisions for their students. And these resources that Dr. Patterson described, the one that's being made available today and the one that will be coming that provides more information on social emotional supports, bring together the guidance, the health information, and the awareness of the social emotional stressors. These um, resources are going to, um, um, the, these resources that have been developed in partnership are critical to help us provide our schools with supports that they need to help turn this school year's challenges into opportunities. The uh, call center has been made available. It was staffed starting last week and is continuing this week. We've been fielding uh, between 30 and 50 calls every day Every question that we get is logged. Every answer is um, recorded and then made available to the person who uh, called in. And we are constantly adjusting our approach and our um, information to be sure that we're meeting the needs. So the, the calls and the questions that are coming from you are really helping to drive the, the next step supports that we provide. That Ready for School Resource Helpline is included in um, this document and it will be made available um, immediately after the press conference through the Department of Education website and also in, on the websites from other agencies and we will also be pushing it out through social media. So I want to thank um, 
the um, agencies that partnered with us to give us the opportunity to um, create resources that really are going to meet the needs for our parents, our students, and our teachers. And at this time, I would like to um, welcome a teacher from the Hot Springs School District to, to share a little bit about their experiences in getting ready for school. Ms. Sarah Turner, an elementary teacher from Hot Springs, is here. And uh, I know you're going to be anxious to hear what she has to say. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> I want to start by saying thank you to Governor Hutchinson and Secretary Key for allowing me to come and speak today. I am Sarah Turner. I have taught four years at the Hot Springs School District and eight years overall. I have taught pre-K, kindergarten, and I'm currently a reading intervention teacher at Oakline STEM Magnet School. I have fears and concerns about going to school this year, just like everyone else. I have fears about what happens when our kids come back into the classrooms, but I have greater fears about what happens if they don't return to on-site instruction. I choose to be a teacher to make a difference and to inspire. We have no better opportunity as educators than right now to influence the lives of scared, uncertain, and worried students and families. I don't have all the answers and neither do my administrators or our leaders. I do know though that we are taking every precaution to plan and protect. I am proud to have the opportunity to return to on-site instruction as an educator and to offer traditional blended and virtual learning opportunities for all of the students in Hot Springs. I hope the very best for every single school district, student, and teachers out there as we all face unique hurdles and unprecedented challenges to learning. This school year will be like any other, will be unlike any other, and I am ready to face the challenge and proud to be among educators across Arkansas who care so deeply about our students and families and about equipping and educating our kids for success in the future. Here is what I'm choosing to focus on and what I'm telling our students and our families to focus on. Our team has been planning since May for the safest way to return to the classrooms in the fall. Like districts across the state, ours has purchased every kind of PPE recommended by professionals at the CDC and the Arkansas Department of Health. Our students and teachers are being provided with plexiglass shields for every desk, and the hallways have bottle filling stations and hand sanitizing stations. We have protocols to allow for social distancing, health screenings, and temperature checks for staffs and students on a daily basis, and a different routine for cafeterias and hallways to keep us as separated as possible. At Hot Springs School District, we brought student athletes back on campus on June 2nd. We held special education and dyslexia screenings beginning in July. We hosted professional developments for staff in July and August. We hosted a traditional graduation ceremony on January 30th. And we held open house this past Tuesday. We have done this safely and successfully. We are communicating with our families about the importance of keeping the students home when they are sick. And we are working through district communications to offer transparent data on our websites and via safety updates to our families. Education will look different this school year, but different isn't bad. We have many challenges, many that we have never even faced before, but we can get through those together. I know that my administrators are ready to work with me and to work with the needs of our families to create flexible educational options. I have been encouraged this week to find that it isn't only me and many of my colleagues meeting this school year with cautious happiness, but our students and families too. Many of our students need this face-to-face -face routine and the socialization that our on-site instruction options offer. Thank you, Governor Hutchison, for supporting on-site instructions beginning Monday, August 24th. We at Hot Springs School District are Trojan strong and we are ready for learning. 
Thank you, Sarah. What an honest uh, reflection as this teacher gets ready for school uh, this year. And uh, I like uh, what she had to say about cautious, op uh, cautious happiness, I believe is the word she used. And also, I just want to draw attention to everybody, the Healthy School Guide. This is really good for parents. I'm glad it's going up on the website. It's a lot of information that's useful. So thanks again to our partners for developing that. With that, we'll take any questions. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, about, I wanted to ask a question about PPE for teachers. Uh, a teacher in this, at Central today posted a picture of the PPE he has been provided for this school semester. It was a plastic sheet labeled face mask. It was wipes in a small and about an eight ounce bottle of hand sanitizer. There was no mask. That was it. Well, I mean, I'll I mean, does that concern you? Dr. Pfeffer, you want to respond to that? Thank you. Yes, so districts are still receiving their supplies of PPE. Um, I know that Little Rock received um, an order, one of their orders of masks today. Um, I don't remember the number of those. Uh, we have uh, worked with them to help um, provide masks for teachers to use prior to the start of school. We are keeping an eye on any school district that has um, any PPE needs. We have, um, we're working on a strategic reserve of PPE that will be available at any time during the school year. So in a lot of cases, districts are, as they get their orders in, they're starting the school year. They'll keep adding to that supply, as will we. And we also are um, placing an order for face shields. So we would be able to supply a face shield in addition to those masks for any teacher in the state that would need one. We, um, yes, we had a, a recommended um, list of PPE that is um, posted on the website and was provided to all school districts in terms of what they might need to think about in ordering for teachers and for students. And that's been the guide that they've used in doing all their ordering. Frank. Uh, the president opposes extra funding for the post office to help with the elections today. Uh, Mr. Kudlow at the White House said so much of the Democratic ask are really liberal left wish list, voting rights and aid to aliens and so forth. That's not our game and the president can't accept that kind of deal. Are voting rights a liberal left wish list and should Americans be concerned uh, that the president isn't supporting? It seems opposed to giving the post office additional money to help with the elections. My comment on the congressional negotiations is simply uh, they need to reach an agreement. Uh, to me, it's not uh, difficult uh, whenever you have uh, 10 things you agree upon that need to be done. Uh, let's get that out the door. And if there's 10 more things you don't agree on, let's fight that battle uh, another time. Uh, there is some urgency to the relief package. And I hope that uh, Congress and the administration can come together to get that done. Uh, I'm not going to uh, get into the uh, beyond the nuances of that. I know what our states need. I know what the uh, NGA is advocating for in terms of a relief package. And it doesn't include everything under the sun. It includes basic, urgent things that the states need and our school districts need to get going again. And that's what they need to agree upon the money to make sure the ballots get to people and get back, is that a partisan issue or should it be? Well, anytime you talk about uh, getting uh, greater access to vote, uh, that should not be, that, that should be a bipartisan issue that everyone agrees that we want people to vote and we want to, uh, them to have access to the ballot. Uh, we've worked hard to make that happen in Arkansas. Uh, the uh, certainly, there's always differences of opinion as to how you get there and how you achieve that result. Uh, that's what the legislative process is about. But uh, we approach that in a bipartisan way in Arkansas, and uh, I think that's how we ought to approach uh, uh, ballot access and uh, access to the voters. Is there any qu other questions? Anything remotely? Uh, Governor, this is uh, Andrew with AP. Uh, a couple of questions uh, related to what uh, what Frank was asking about uh, following up on the unemployment extension. I want to see, are you 
gauging how much support there would be in the legislature for uh, for that appropriation, and is that factoring into your decision on whether or not this, whether or not to do it? Um, and on the, on that schools guide, I wanted to ask: Is this guidance, or is anything in here going to change any of the directives uh, for for schools and how they operate uh, in in the school year? Uh, no, this is these are. Uh this is guidance for parents, it's best practices, it's recommendations that, uh, uh, that they might need to have to understand what it takes to get prepared for this school year. This is not uh, to change the directives from the Department of Health. Uh, these are really useful tools that uh, every parent can read. It's in common language, as Dr. Patterson said. And uh, the first part of your question uh, was on uh, the uh, legislative support uh, for the extension of the unemployment compensation. And certainly that uh, uh, has a bearing on how we go forward because this would take legislative approval. It takes an appropriation if the money goes through FEMA, which is the plan right now. And so we continue to measure uh, uh, the legislature and their approach to this. Uh, as well as continue to wait for additional guidance uh, from Washington on this. Any other questions? Uh, Governor, this is Josh Briggs from the Sling Courier here in Benton. And I have a question regarding testing and new cases. Um, throughout this five months of the pandemic, you tell us every day how many tests were conducted yesterday and then we get the new cases. Is there a way to tell like, for instance, the 652 new cases today, is there a way to tell how many tests those new cases come from? Because obviously the 5,100 from yesterday, you haven't received the results from. Uh, yes, I mean, you have to look at them a little bit separately. Uh, one would be the, the amount of testing that we're doing in a 24-hour period uh, is very instructive. Uh, that comes, that tells us uh, what our radar is like to identify new cases. Uh, and then, you know, the other part of it, uh, you know, in terms of where those cases are coming from, that's what we do with our contact tracing. And Dr. Merrill, did you have a comment on that? Um, did, did I answer your question or did you want to probe more deeply? Well, Yes and no. I, I'm just curious on the 652 new cases today. For instance, on I think it was Tuesday, whenever we were so low down in the 300s, and other days when we're low, it's often said that it's because of testing was low. So we have to kind of judge off of that. But even though testing was low the day before, the 300 cases didn't come from those low tests. So I was wondering, is there a way that the state is keeping up with we had? 300 cases from X amount of tests done, or are they kind of all jumbled in one and, and you kind of figured it out that way? To me, it's, there's some relevance to, uh, you know, if you test more, uh, you're usually able to identify additional cases. Now, there's a limit to that, uh, and uh, but whenever we looked at the 300 and some cases, our testing was down a little bit. I knew that if we test a little bit more, we would have had more cases. But you can, uh, you know, you can, we, we looked at it and we knew that we were still declining or flat. So it was still a good news day. That's uh, the best I can answer that. But that's one of the reasons that uh, we push uh, for additional testing. It just allows us to know uh, where the concerns are and alerts the public as to where uh, positive cases are. Mike? Uh, you were on the buzz yesterday and threw out some numbers about attendance for football games of 22 to 25 percent. It was not clear if you were talking about Razorback games or high school games, because there was a guy that was quoted in the paper the other day saying the attendance threshold would be 66 percent. The, I was speaking of uh, college sports uh, and not high school sports. In reference to high school sports, uh, it's a separate issue as to uh, how many people can be seated in the stands at a football game or any sporting events. And if you have more than 
200, if more than 100 people at the event, then you have to present the plan to the uh, Department of Health to review and to approve, and it can go up to 66% if the plan is approved. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Romero and I talked about this yesterday, and we hope that we can standardize this a little bit because that means we have to have over 300 uh, stadiums that are approved with specific plans, and if we can give some general guidance, that might be helpful. But we need to be prepared for uh, the season. We need to be prepared that uh, not every uh, seat in the stands is going to be filled. You're going to have social distancing. You're going to have mask requirements. You're going to have uh, some requirements in terms of the uh, uh, concession stands uh, that will be uh, delivered by the Department of Health and that guidance. So it's not going to be the normal year of going to uh, the football stadium. Uh, you know, a good example, one coming up is a salt bowl. A salt bowl, uh, which is, you know, could have thousands of people there, hopefully tens of thousands of people, but it'll be in a huge uh, arena that will allow social distancing, but that plan has to be approved as well. So you can't give a specific percentage for every arena right now. We have to look at the plan. Frank? You and some other governors have asked for $500 billion in unrestricted state funds from the federal government. Can you talk about why that money is needed and what the consequences will be if you don't get it? Uh, that number was, first of all, arrived at as a National Governors Association consensus for looking at what the states need. And Arkansas is in a good position because we don't have a deficit. Uh, we're not uh, under underwater in terms of our finances and so uh, we're not asking for any federal money to fill our budget holes because we don't have a budget hole. Now we do want assistance in terms of, of uh, additional support for hospitals and schools and special needs that we have out there uh, but our budget is fine. But other states have been hit much much harder and I put on my National Governors Association hat and I advocate you know from a state perspective they do need that level of assistance as they look at future CARES Act funding. And if they don't get it? Well, uh, there'll be a lot of states that are hurting. Uh, absolutely. Uh, there, uh, Leslie, and then we'll go back remotely. Yes. Uh, so the John Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center puts our positivity rate at 12.4. So I wondered if you and Dr. Romero discuss that, why there's a discrepancy between the number we have, and, and if, if you discover that that percentage is right, does that impact your decision on schools? Over what period of time did they measure that positivity rate? Uh, don't know. It's, all I know is that they put us at 10th in the country. Well, you have to look first at over what period of time uh, that uh, positivity rate was measured. Uh, because if you look at uh, the cumulative positivity rate in Arkansas, it's 8.6%, I believe, 8.8% cumulative positivity. If you look at the last 14 days, you'll have a different number. If you look at the last seven days, you'll have a different number. So we'll just have to look at that and see what the uh, uh, time frame was that they measured that. And uh, uh, as I've said, we've got some more work to do there. Let's go remotely. Is there a question there? Uh, Governor, it's Mitch <laughs> over at Channel 4 and Fox. Um, Dr. Romero mentioned a plan to investigate cases and contact tracing at schools. Um, will there be dedicated people, uh, contact tracers, tracers for school cases? Is there a concern about needing more contact uh, tracers as schools reopen? I'm going to let Dr. Romero take that first and I'll supplement. Thank you, Governor. So, uh, no, there is not a designated individuals or individuals to, that will be looking at this. They will be within the contact tasting pool. We have dedicated lines for the schools to reach us if they have questions, but it will be going into the pool at this point. Um, we have not uh, segregated the school cases out of the general pub, uh, pub, pop, population. We think at this point, and again, it's a fluid situation, that we have more than enough contact tracers to follow up with these cases. 
and we uh, continue to talk about it. We talked about that yesterday, and uh, we uh, want to make sure there are the resources there for effective contact tracing with our schools. And uh, uh, right now, as Dr. Romero said, the Department of Health is preparing for that daily. Governor, this is Allison with 4029 News. <clears throat> uh, now and just in the next couple of weeks, uh, a lot of uh, college towns across Arkansas, including here at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, will be having an influx of students. Um, many have already, you know, started their move-in dates. Um, a lot of those students coming from other states, from out of Arkansas, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi. Uh, what is your concern that we could see a spike in cases among young adults as we are having uh, college students uh, begin classes, um, move here for the semester um, to start school on campus. Uh, I believe the University of Arkansas has a very, very good plan uh, to uh, prepare students, to uh, respond to students' needs, and to uh, minimize the risk on campus. Uh, we know that there will be cases, and that's why we've devoted resources to uh, respond to that. Uh, I, I think, and, and for UAMS is a big part of that, uh, the contact tracing, uh, the testing capacity at our higher education. So my concerns are uh, not uh, necessarily what happens on the University of Arkansas campus, but what happens on Friday night and Saturday night in other parts of the town. And uh, knowing that uh, students are, are active and so that's where the students need to act maturely. They need to make sure that uh, they're careful not just on campus but elsewhere because uh, that impacts, uh, uh, you know, our whole community. Governor Neil Gladner in Hot Springs, two questions for you, sir. Uh, a moment ago, Dr. Pfeffer made mention of a stockpile of PPE for districts that might have that need, which poses the question, who pays for the PPE? Is it paid for by individual districts or is that being paid for by the state? And well, to your question well, about I, campus, I, 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 or your answer about campus activities a moment ago about football, do you have any thought to tailgating? All right, in terms of uh, uh, the first question, each school district received CARES Act funding directly uh, for PPE, uh, and so they have their own resources to, to utilize for that. And then secondly, the Department of Education set aside $1 million uh, to have their own reservoir of PPE that they can distribute in case the school have, didn't order enough time or they need some assistance there. And so that's how it's paid for. Uh, there's a a lot of layers that can make sure that uh, that's available to them. In terms of tailgating, uh, that's a, an example of where uh, the plan has to be approved by the Department of Health for uh, not just uh, what happens in the stands, but around it as well. And so uh, there will be, like I said, a different uh, environment. Uh, we'll wait and see what it looks like because those uh, plans and, and uh, reviews are still ongoing. Anything else? Uh, with that, uh, did anybody else have, Dr. Patterson, I know you were probably jumping to say something on some of those questions. Are you good?